Stay standing and grab your Bible. And we're going to turn our attention now to God's Word, to the book of Galatians, chapter 3. I'm excited about the message this morning that I have to share with you. It was inspired by my 15-year-old daughter and a conversation that her and I were having at the kitchen table earlier this week. Uh, We were talking about friendships and relationships and fitting in and Those are things that are on the forefront of every teenage boy or girl, whether they know it or not. Where do I fit? Where do I belong? And so we were talking about these kinds of things. And at the end of the conversation, my daughter said, my daughter Abby said, you know, Dad, I guess sometimes you just need to stand back so that you can step in to the things that God has for you and not be afraid to stand out. I said, hey, you want to preach this weekend? (laughs) She wasn't too excited about that, but I pulled out my phone and wrote it down. I said, there's a sermon in that. That'll preach. And so I'm excited to share uh, what's on my heart with you this morning. But let's look here because I think it ties directly into what Paul writes in Galatians chapter 3, verse 1. Read along with me. It'll be on the screen for you if you don't have a Bible with you. Paul says, oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. So let me ask you only this. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish? Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Did you suffer so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? Does he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you do so by the works of the law or by hearing with faith? Just as Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness, know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, In you shall all the nations be blessed. So then, those who are of faith are blessed, along with Abraham, the man of faith. For all who rely on works of the law are under a curse, for it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. Now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law, for the righteous shall live by faith. But the law is not of faith. Rather, the one who does them shall live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. So that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. The word of the Lord. Amen. You can be seated. The title of my message this morning is Longing to Belong. Longing to Belong. I think that the desire to... You have to see the picture. Did you see that? Okay. I just wanted you to see that. You ever feel like that? (laughs) I fit in, I promise. (laughs) The desire to belong is one of the most powerful longings in the human heart. You can hear it in the word itself, be longing. (laughs) What are we longing to be? Accepted, we're longing to be be approved, we're longing to find our place. And this this is a desire that we were created with, like so many of our other desires. But one of the, the great dangers about desire is that when those needs aren't met, the craving becomes so strong that we can seek it in unhealthy ways. We can become desperate to do things to satisfy our longings that we would otherwise never do. We can make a 
a multitude of compromises to trick ourselves into a short-term relief of a longing, trading the authentic thing for a cheap imitation. One of the most interesting ways I've ever heard sin described is as an over-desire. And those that understand the language and the description in the Bible of sin delve deep into it to tell us that we all have these God-given desires that are right, that we were created with. But the problem comes when our desire for these things drives us out beyond the boundary of what is good. This is where our desires become distorted and where they become dangerous even. Not that they in themselves are wrong, but where they might lead us to satisfy them can lead us into tricky places. So think of a fire. In the fireplace, in its proper place, with the right boundaries, it is both beautiful and warming. But the very same substance that provides warmth and light when it's not contained in its proper place can bring devastation and destruction. And we see that even now all around us. It was Soren Kierkegaard who defined sin as the effort to build our identity on anything besides God. And here's where we begin to understand why sin is so destructive. Our desires for certain things and the places that we will seek to fulfill them can lead us to an all-out identity crisis. The loss of who we really are, turning away from God himself. We've forgotten. It's better to be rejected for who you really are than accepted for something that you're not. The deepest kind of feeling of being alone is being in a group of people, surrounded by people, but not really being known. Trying Desperately to pay the price of admission, to belong, to fit in. But what we find is that the price of admission is too high and results for many people in the loss of everything, even ourselves. Now, what does that have to do with Galatians? This is where Paul finds this little church that he planted in this part of the world. They've drifted off of their relationship with God and are in danger of losing their identity altogether. And Paul is so shocked by this. It's so bizarre to him that in the opening words of the verses that we've read, he says, who has bewitched you? <laughs> it's like you've come under the spell of someone. You're not even yourself anymore. What's happened? And for the Galatians, it's not unlike us. The drive and the desire to fit in when a group of the in crowd came to town had made them compromise their beliefs in order to please people. They were hoping to be accepted by a certain group. It was a certain group that had the appearance of being important. And it wasn't just affecting the Galatians' belief because, see, belief and behavior always go together. What you believe in your heart ultimately affects who you become and expresses it in the way that you live in the world. And so the Galatians had started to consider some pretty bizarre behavior because there's always a price of admission to fitting in. 
Every group, every clique, every in crowd has its price of admission. For the Galatians, if you can believe it, (laughs) the price of admission into the in crowd was, are you ready for this? Circumcision. As an adult. And they were actually considering it. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Ouch. And we look at them like they're crazy. But what parts of ourselves are we willing to cut away so that we can fit in? What beliefs are we willing to compromise to the point of changing our behavior to the danger of losing our identity altogether? This is why Paul is so adamant. This is why Paul is so passionate He's saying to the Galatians, Galatians, your identity is with God. You've been accepted into the beloved. You belong with him. He's proven his love to you in the greatest expression that this world knows, a willingness to lay down his own life for you. Oh, foolish Galatians. Why would you do this to yourselves? Paul's blown away. And it's fascinating how Paul writes and how he argues and fights to bring the Galatians back to a realization of who they really are because they're forgetting, they're losing it. He fights to encourage the Galatians in this letter not to fit in, but rather to remind them that they already belong and are accepted with God and that nothing can threaten that status except their own decision to drift away. So what does Paul do? If you've been reading or you're familiar with this letter, he's shared in the first two chapters his own experience. And what we read in the verses that we've read here now is that he then also reminds them of their experience. And then he goes even further to show them that his experience and their experience was not some oddball outsider way of experiencing God, but it was how it was meant to be all along. He goes all the way back to Abraham. And he says, Abraham believed God And it was counted to him as righteousness. I don't know if you saw this phrase in the verses that we read, but it actually says here in Galatians that the gospel was preached to Abraham. Did you see that in verse (laughs) 8? Did that blow your mind? And the scripture, verse 8, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, in you shall all the nations be blessed. That's mind-blowing. I thought the gospel started when Jesus died and rose again and we went out to share the gospel, the good news. No. The gospel started way before that. This good news being announced and pronounced when God put his love and grace on a man named Abraham who wasn't seeking him. And gave him a promise and said, Abraham, I will surely bless you. (laughs) Well, that's good news. (laughs) What did I do? Nothing. Well, what do I need to do? Nothing. Just believe and trust me and follow me. And I will make a place for you and all your descendants, and you will belong with me, and you will be my people, and I will be your God, and everyone who comes to be me by faith will also be the sons and daughters of Abraham. This is is awesome. (laughs) Because remember, the in crowd comes from Jerusalem, and they're like, hey, we know the real apostles. We're from Jerusalem. 
we've got some things that we want to go over and talk through with you. And, and so all of these new Gentiles suddenly feel like outsiders. They don't fit in anymore. They're not keeping the right rules. They don't know the traditions. They're not aware of the customs. And so this group is saying, if you really want to fit in, here's how you need to act. Here's what you need to do. Here's the rules that you need to keep. Here's the price of admission to fitting in with, you know, the in crowd. And Paul says, no, no. <laughs> Forget that. You're in. If you have faith, you're in. If you believe God, it's been credited to your account already. It's in your account, the righteousness of God in Christ. You don't need to try to fit in You just need to rejoice and believe that you belong. It's amazing. And so Paul essentially says to the Galatians, let's step back and look at the reality of where we're at. Let's step in to the relationship that's been already promised and provided and let's not be afraid to stand out if you're a note taker and you have your Galatians journal these are the points that we're going to look at as we look at what Paul says here and how he does this and so this is the simple outline that we're going to follow step back step back the first thing that Paul invites the Galatians to do is to step back and I had this crazy thought while I was studying last night it occurred to me that many times the first step of faith is a step back. That sounds counterintuitive to me because when I think of stepping out in faith or moving forward in faith, it's always forward. Charge by faith, step ahead by faith, step out in faith. And, And yes, many, many times that's true. But sometimes the first step of faith is actually a step back a courageous step backwards to see things differently and gain some perspective. Because over and over, the Bible contrasts faith with what? Sight. We walk not by sight, but by faith. Faith is an entirely different perspective. Sometimes we have our heads down in life, and our eyes open on the things that we see right in front of us, and we're just moving forward. And really, to walk by faith is to take a step back and say, not what I see, not what's right in front of me, but what does the perspective of faith bring to the picture? To see things that are not visible. Let me add another word to this heading, step back, Put the word reflect. Sometimes you have to step back and reflect to really see the way forward. Sometimes you have to look back and learn. Because when you're going through life, head down, trying to survive, just trying to make it through, you don't always realize where you're at. It's easy to get lost. It's easy to drift off when you're not paying attention. That's what the Galatians had done. And that's what Paul wants the Galatians to do. Step back and what? Reflect. Reflect, Galatians. Let me tell you my story. Let me tell you my experience, how I didn't ever get close to God by keeping the rules. That only led me further and further away from God until God in his grace met me and blessed me by showing me who he was and opening a way through his son for me to come to him. Paul's inviting them to step back and reflect on his experience. He's inviting them to step back and reflect on their own experience. Did you see that series of questions in the opening of Galatians chapter three? Let's look at them again. He says, let me ask you this in verse two, Galatians. And these, by the way, are rhetorical questions. They're questions for reflection. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or the hearing with faith? Are you so foolish? 
Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? By the way, I think it's funny. He says, let me ask you only this, and then just peppers him with questions. <laughs> just going to ask you one thing, or five. <laughs> Did you suffer, verse 4, so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? Does he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you do so by works of the law or hearing with faith? These are reflection questions to help them to step back and reflect on the fact that they were in danger of forgetting and disconnecting themselves from their relationship with God. The lessons that the Galatians had earned up to this point were hard earned and they were in danger of forgetting because these were precious things that God had done. He had given them his spirit. He had worked miracles among them. He had given them strength to suffer and to endure. Paul says, do you remember that? And here I think is a principle that's so important for us to consider that we don't learn in life merely by experience. We learn by reflecting on our experience and by the honest and right evaluation that comes from that reflection. We all know people and we all have at times been the person that just keeps doing the same thing over and over, right? The definition supposedly from Einstein of insanity, doing the same thing and expecting a different result. How do we get into that trap? Because we don't reflect on our experience. You don't learn from experience automatically. You have to step back and reflect and say, what should I learn from this? Maybe, maybe I need to do something different than what I'm doing. And the perspective of faith can be so helpful. And this is what Paul invites the Galatians to do. It's brilliant and it's mind-blowing what Paul does here and what he writes them to the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he says, think about it, Galatians, a group of the so-called in crowd comes along and says, you don't fit in. Here's what you have to do. The temptation to please the in crowd in order to be accepted is almost inescapable. But Paul says, no, actually, what you and I have experienced when we receive the Holy Spirit is the very promise of Abraham This blew my mind when I studied this passage too. Look at verse 14. So that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles. Way back in Genesis when God said to Abraham, surely I will bless you. What was that blessing? Paul seems to argue all this much time later, thousands of years and centuries later, as he writes to the Galatians, the blessing that was promised to Abraham, are you ready for this? The blessing that would come to the Gentiles is the end of verse 14, so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. What was it that God was promising to do one day that he let Abraham in on. He said, one day, Abraham, I will give my spirit to those who come to me in faith. And they will live in a relationship with me through my very spirit living in them. What a promise. Not an external list of rules to follow, but an internal spirit and relationship of love with the living God. Paul invites them to step back and reflect on that and to understand that both his experience, their experience, and the very experience of Abraham himself agree. And Paul says, essentially, guess what? When you reflect on these things, you realize you don't have to try so hard to fit in. You already belong. This is the blessing. Well, then Paul invites them, having encouraged them to step back 
and reflect. He, he invites them to step in now then and to relate. It's an incredible thought to think that the first step of faith is a step back, but certainly we realize that the step back is not where it ends, like, like a mountain climber walking back to a certain vantage point in order to visualize his route or pulling out a map to see where he is in relationship to where he wants to be. Once he steps back and makes the discovery, then he steps in and steps forward. And these are inevitable steps of faith as well. And this seems to be Paul's point. Paul seems to be saying here in Galatians, Galatians, <laughs> who, who's cast a spell on you? What's come over you? Have you forgotten how have you so easily drifted off from knowing you are blessed with the blessing that was promised to Abraham? You have received the Spirit of God. You've been given the Holy Spirit. Don't, don't lose this. Don't leave this. This is an incredible gift that you've been given by God to relate to him. And it's through the Holy Spirit that God himself has come to live inside of you. It's through the Holy Spirit that you have come to know him because he's leading you into the truth and teaching and bringing you to remembrance of all that Jesus taught. See, Paul wants them to step back and to reflect in order that they might step in and relate to God, not on the basis of their performance, not on the basis of their rule keeping. He wants them to relate to God on the basis of the gift of his spirit who pours out the love of God into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. And the man or the woman who's experienced the love of God being poured out in their heart through the Holy Spirit has been given such a sense of belonging and acceptance that we say to God, here I am. I'm yours. This is where I belong. See, through the Holy Spirit, God will take his word and he'll renew our minds so that, as Paul says in Romans 12, we are no longer conformed to this world. Did you know that the world is trying to press you into its mold? There is a mold. There is a form. And all of the pressure in this life and what's popular and what's cool and what you have to have, the world is offering it up saying, if you'll fit into this, You'll be happy. Paul says, we are not being conformed to this world. We are being transformed, set free by the renewing of our minds. And Paul wants the Galatians to remember, to renew their minds that they've been given the Holy Spirit that they don't have to kill themselves or cut at themselves, literally through circumcision. They don't have to sell their selves to the price of admission to fit in. Sometimes you have to step back and reflect on what you are so desperately trying to fit into to ask yourself, do I really want to fit into that? in order that you can step into the truly meaningful place that you really belong. Paul says in so many words to the Galatians, step back, step in, and thirdly, stand out. Stand out. Dear church, we are so afraid to stand out in our day. We want to blend in. We want to prove to the world that, no, 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 we're, so, we're way more like you than you think.
And Paul would say, don't be afraid to stand out. Did you know that this is in our very name? That we who are a part of the church, the church is a word, ecclesia, in the original language. It means called out ones. You've been called out. (laughs) Stop blending in. Stop trying to look like everyone around you. Stand out. Don't be afraid. And it's not that hard. I don't know if you've noticed, but if you don't have a foul mouth, you stand out. Talking to you high school students now. (laughs) Just that alone on your sports team, the way you talk, will be enough to make you stand out. You don't cuss, man? Nope. Why not? (laughs) Because all that I am and all that I have belongs to Jesus Christ. You know what will make you stand out when you live in wine country? Drinking water, yeah. (laughs) Going to a party. Everyone's drinking. What I see is Christians so desperate to prove, no, we fit in, we drink too, yeah. (laughs) Do you have that liberty? Yes. Is it a sin? No. I see such a lack of wisdom all around me, though. Wanting so desperately to fit in to prove to the world we can have fun too. Stand out, church. Don't be afraid. Realize who you are. Realize whose you are. You are blessed. Do you realize that? That's what Paul says. You're blessed. The blessing of Abraham is given to you. (laughs) Can you begin to live from that place rather than trying to prove something to the world or yourself or the people around you so that you fit in? Can you say, I'm blessed, I'm accepted by God, there's nothing else that I need, so don't be drunk with wine, but be filled with his spirit. Singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs to one another. Saying the one who made me and who loves me, and who gave himself for me, what else can I need? I don't need all these other things. Paul's saying, as the people of faith stand out, and he's gonna go into a further description of this. We're basically out of time, but would you turn with me just real quickly over to chapter five of Galatians? I know we're jumping ahead, so spoiler alert, but... I think most of you know these verses anyways. Here's Paul's way of saying stand out. He says, verse 16, I say, walk by the Spirit. There it is again, the Spirit. Did you receive the Spirit when you believed by the hearing of faith or works of the law? Do you think that because you started in the Spirit, you're gonna continue and perfect yourself in the flesh? That's crazy. Walk in the spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh, verse 16, for the desires of the flesh are against the spirit and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh for these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the spirit, You're not under the law. Now, the works of the flesh are obvious, boring. Here's what everybody's trying to do so desperately to fit in. Sexual immorality, impurity, boring. Sensuality, boring. Idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, boring, orgies, and things like these. That's what everybody's doing. It's so crazy to think that the world, though 99% of everyone in the world is doing everything they can to knock out that list, they think, wow, we're really rebels. No, it's boring. You're doing what everybody else is doing. You want to know what's exciting? A life in the spirit, walking in the spirit. 
walking in the desires of the Spirit, being led by the Spirit. And here's where Paul shifts gears and he says, the fruit of the Spirit, verse 22, is love. You want to stand out? Love people instead of using people. Think with me. The fruits of the Spirit, we're familiar, but just think of Think of where we live and how things go generally in the world around us and tell me how much you will stand out if your life becomes characterized by these things. Do you think you'll stand out in a day of cynicism if you have joy? What are you so happy about? Do you know who's president? Have you seen the political scene, right? All these things that people get so worked up about and freaked out about and there's so much cynicism about it. What would happen if the Christians stood out and said, hey, we have joy, why? Because Jesus is on the throne. We don't have to fear peace instead of anxiety. Do you think a people full of peace would stand out in a day riddled with anxiety? Patience <laughs> in a I got to have it right now, get out of my way, Black Friday at Walmart, stampede for the TV. <laughs> you think you'll stand out if you allow the Spirit of God to produce the fruit of patience in you and kindness, Goodness, faithfulness, not flakiness. In a day of flakiness, do you think you'll stand out if you're a faithful person? Gentleness, self-control, against such there is no law. Worship team, please come up. You've got to help me end this thing. <laughs> Church, don't be afraid to stand out. I know it's not always the comf most comfortable place to be. But it's the place where we belong. Because the truth is, if you're a follower of Jesus, you won't fit in to the image that everybody else is trying to conform to. Because God has a different plan for you. Romans chapter eight. He has predestined us to be conformed to the image of his son. To look like Jesus. And what we'll have to get to grips with is that many times we may feel alone because we won't fit in. But that's okay. You ever been invited to a party and, or excuse me, not invited to a party and your feelings were hurt? Why didn't I get invited? And then you stepped back and you reflected and you thought about it and you thought, you know what, I wouldn't really want to go anyways. <laughs> it's a weird feeling. You feel the pain of being left out. But with the right perspective, you realize that's not something you want to fit into anyways. And you realize you're not really alone. God is with us. His spirit lives in us. And there's just a simple question because I, I have a whole nother page, but we need to, we need to stop. Um, there's a question here that struck me to ask you. When Paul says, let me ask you this one thing, he says in verse two, did you receive the Spirit? Now, Paul is asking it again rhetorically. He knows that they have, and he wants them to reflect on how they received the Spirit. It wasn't by works of the law. You didn't conjure it up. It wasn't something you did. 
you heard and when your hearing was joined with faith, the gift of the Spirit was given to you. Here's the point that I want to make because I think the first part of the question is really the right one for us. Have you received the Holy Spirit? See, for us, it's a point of doctrine. Well, yes, when you believe at the time of when you come to faith, the Spirit comes to live inside of you. No, but for them, it was an experience. They knew undeniably and undoubtedly the day that they received the gift of the Holy Spirit. It stood them out like sore thumbs, you could say, on the day of Pentecost when they began praising God and that welling up of the Spirit inside of them gushed forth tongues that they didn't even know. God's name was being praised in tongues that they had never studied or learned. It was miraculous when Peter stood up because he was known as being a sort of timid guy, but with boldness, he preached and proclaimed the message of Christ. It was an experience. It was not a matter of doctrine. <laughs> so I ask you, have you received the Holy Spirit? Can you point to the day, the time, when you experience the power and presence of God through his Holy Spirit? You don't have to feel weird about it. Paul in the book of Acts shows up to a group of believers that really believed. But after spending a little bit of time with him, he said, you know, did you receive the Holy Spirit since you believed? And they're like, we, we've never even heard of the Holy Spirit. So let's stand together.